five years now. Uh, my title is a senior consultant, however, I consider myself a journeyman. Who, who else here considers themselves a journeyman? Okay, quite a few hands. Uh, who here thinks he, do, you know, he doesn't know what journeyman means? Okay, so that, uh, I only saw a few hands as well, so it looks like not a lot of people bought into uh, the idea of craftsmanship. At Optiva, we believe in the software craftsmanship, which is really just the idea that you couldn't uh, shoehorn learning software development by following a formal process of, say, a university degree. I actually have two university degrees. That was still not sufficient. We actually learn on the job every day through practices like pair programming and learning through mentors. That's what we mean by craftsmanship. Uh, so, anyways, the topic today though is about whatever happened to desktop development in Ruby. Um, I want to get a show of hands of how many people here actually do desktop development in Ruby today. Okay, so that's a little surprising. There's only two hands that went off. This is not a Rails conference. Yet I only saw two hands for desktop development. Uh, who here has had any sort of experience with desktop development with any language? Okay, that makes sense. So the trend in the industry did move more toward web applications. However, desktop applications are getting pumped out every day. Uh, and I mean, the best example of that is that Apple just opened the Mac Store, uh, and, um, a new online Mac Store for the Mac platform itself, as opposed to the iPhone or the iPad, because the, the model proved itself. So those applications are being written, but why are they not being written in Ruby? That's what this talk is about today. I mean, people are using Objective-C, they're using .NET, they're using even Java, based technologies, but not Ruby. And why is that? So uh, this has been my motivation. Uh, so what I want to do is basically go through I want to go through uh, the current frameworks and libraries that are available in Ruby and then cover these three specifically, Shoes, Limelight, and Glimmer, because these are the three uh, frameworks that take the most advantage of Ruby in order to provide the, the developer with a DSL in order to simplify the desktop development. Other frameworks are more like veneers on top of existing C libraries and, and such. Uh, so let's first start by talking about what desktop apps are, just to be on the same page. So desktop apps typically uh, start without an internet connection, consist of widgets like buttons, text, uh, labels, tabs, etc. They can be maximized, restored, zoomed, minimized, closed, so they're windows in general. And you know, they usually are launchable with an icon. My definition explicitly excludes you know, full screen 3D games. I don't want to do OpenGL or any of that. That's not what I'm talking about today. Uh, widgets, gadgets, I'm not talking about that either. And I'm not talking about you know, GUI-less command line applications. All right, so uh, what, what has been my motivation behind this stuff about Ruby? I've had about four years of experience doing this stuff about it uh, in Java for the most part. I did a little bit of uh, C++ before that, but it was mostly Java. And this is an example of the syntax we have to write for a simple program that's as simple as the whole world. So as you notice, there's a lot of code over there. Uh, a lot of it is not necessarily relevant to the UI. So there's a lot of boilerplate code as well. And then uh, if you look at the code, it's actually imperative. So it's, it goes line by line to describe what's going on as opposed to, say, something more like how people work with user interfaces on the web. They usually declare user interfaces with HTML in a hierarchical syntax that nests, you know, forms within divs, within body, within whatever. It's more visual syntax as opposed to a imperative syntax. All right, here is the WX Ruby, which is one of the frameworks that, that sit on top of WX. Uh, or sit, sit on top of a you know, existing older desktop library in order, to, in order to let you write desktop applications in Ruby. And this is the newer sugar syntax, which they, which they actually try to improve the existing WX syntax and make it a little cleaner. But still, it's very verbose. It doesn't feel like they're, like they're pushing Ruby to the boundary you know, of what Ruby can offer you. 
Okay, here's an example of the, the same exact program, Hello World, written with Glimmer. Glimmer is uh, a DSL uh, library in Ruby that lets you write user interface code uh, by relying on the Java, Java SWT library behind the scenes. It actually runs on top of JRuby. That's how it works. Uh, and if you notice, the syntax, the words that are used are actually the minimum, amount, the minimum number of words needed in order to specify the user interface. Not no more, no less. So we got this shell, which represents the window. A shell is a window in SWT terminology. Uh, the shell text property says uh, hello world is Jackal. It's got a label, a single label. And then the text uh, property is written the label says hello world. So, and then at the bottom there's an open method that opens it up and shows the window to the user. So in a way, this is like the minimum uh, basic syntax possible, or needed, sorry, for it to specify the UI. And why should the developers write any more code than that? So that's kind of why uh, I wanted to do this talk today in order to open people's you know, minds about what possibilities are available in Ruby as opposed to something like Objective-C, uh, as well as talk about the different frameworks and uh, the, the leading frameworks nowadays and what they offer over each other. So, uh, this is just a brief overview of the frameworks out there, but the ones I'll be covering on is be at the bottom. So, shoes. Um, who here has heard of shoes? Shoes is the oldest of those three, and uh, it was one of the first that actually tried to take advantage of Ruby's capabilities for building hierarchical DSLs that represent the user interface. Uh, so it was created by Wyvern Lucky Stiff, and his thing about it was basically he hated all the other libraries and he thought they were really bulky and not, their code was not nice and it didn't take advantage of Ruby. And as well as he's not a big fan of desktop app look in general, so he wanted something that can enable more web. <coughs> branding or web design on desktop applications. That's why he created Shoes. So he actually wrote, up, he wrote the native uh, platform dependent widget support from the ground up. Uh, so it supports Mac OS, Windows, Linux. It's got a native looking feel. Supports 2D drawing, animation. Uh, and the applications are usually launched with the Shoes runner. So before I continue, let me just launch a quick application. So let's open up the shoes example. So when you install shoes on your platform, there's usually a shoe runner, a shoes runner that actually comes with it. And it enables you to basically right click on uh, a Ruby file, say open with, and then you pick the shoes runner. That's a clock, an animated clock. Go back to the slides. So, uh, how does shoes code look like? So, the main application is declared with shoes.app, and then attributes can be either set with hash. Kind of, uh, hash uh, parameters, kind of like height and width. Or background is more set with the method approach. It's a different DSL style. Uh, so background, RGB, etc. And then within it, it has the different widgets. Say, I want to show like the buttons in this case, and then there's a label at the bottom. There's also a paragraph widget, which actually renders the paragraph that you see. The purpose of this talk is not to give you a tutorial, but more of an overview, so I will not be going too much the details of how the syntax works, but this is just a quick overview of how shoes syntax work. Uh, so it's got web-like features. Um, they not only support buttons in the user interfaces, but also hyperlinks. Um, it's got support for images and colors, uh, margin and padding. So you can build you know, desktop applications that have more of a look and feel that, that resembles the web as opposed to just a plain gray you know, application. Uh, it only supports two layouts, and I believe Y did that for simplicity. He thought he could see everything, he could lay everything out in two ways. In one of two ways, either a stack or a flow. Let's go over the layouts first. So a stack layout plays things 
on top of each other. It's, that, it's as simple as what you see in the user interface. A flow layout is more like creating words in a book. Things go start you know, from the left, left side and then go to the right, and then once they hit the end of the line, they drop to the next line. So, uh, why is the vision of this is that you can, with a combination of stacks and flows, you can accomplish any layout you want. Whether that holds up in practice, uh, I'm not sure it totally holds up, but for the most part it works. There are, cases, there are a few cases where that costs the thing. Uh, widgets supported by shoes are buttons, a uh, text edit widget, progress bar, scroll bars, dialogs. And then there's also event handling, like hovering, leaving, clicking. Uh, tables and trees, I did not find support for them. Unfortunately, and these are the two fundamental widgets for business applications. Um, so that's one thing that's missing from Shoes. Uh, however, Shoes is still being maintained despite the disappearance of why the lucky stood. And I've, I've gotten in contact with the maintainers of Shoes uh, a few times, and they're pretty prompt with their responses usually. They're actually working on fixing quite a few things and improving the framework. We already saw an example of animation, so I'm not going to go too much into that, but shoes support shapes, paths, curves, and transformations, part of that. Uh, one thing about animation is it's, it's got this DSL where you can say at 8, 8. I think that means 8 frames a second. And then it, run, it invokes that block every time, and then that block you can do what happens on every frame, that's how you can animate it. So it's pretty straightforward syntax. <coughs> All right, this is a slightly more complex example. Open it up. There we go. So this is a slightly more sophisticated example of the shoes app. Just wanted to show it to show you can do more interactive stuff too. All right, next framework, Limelight. Anybody here heard of Limelight? Okay, quite a few hands. So Limelight uh, was conceived by Micah Martin. Uh, he's the son of uh, Uncle Bob. You've heard of him, um, a very you know, uh, pro pro proliferate uh, speaker on software best practices as well as software design. And uh, Micah's thing was basically, he hated how on the web, in order for a developer to get a job done, as opposed to on, in the desktop world, you have to work not only with one language, you have to do like five languages. Like you have to do uh, the server side language, the client side language, there's the HTML you know, language for the user interface, there's the CSS language for the styling, and then you know, there's a SQL as well. So his idea was Ruby is such a good language for building VSLs, and a very good example of that is like Rails 3's new support, for example, for SQL alternative, where you can write your queries in Ruby syntax for the most part and avoid SQL unless you need, you know, a very deep customization. So Ruby is a great language for facilitating the ability to write code in Ruby, yet be able to process things like user interfaces, uh, uh, like queries, many, like many many other things, so why, why does the developer have to work in five languages? And in my mind, I mean, what I agree with him about is that developers accepted what, what they were handed because of historical reasons. We were handed JavaScript because of historical reasons, and however, if for any reason, Python was the language of choice, we would have been doing Python today on the browser, on the client side web applications. <coughs> if otherwise Ruby was the language of choice, we would have been in heaven now, you know, doing Ruby both on the server and on the client. In fact, I've, I've heard, I've met a developer, um, his name is Chris Powers, who's actually building a server-side framework in JavaScript that lets you do an MVC kind of uh, way of building applications in JavaScript so that he can write both his client and server-side code in one language. The reason, so the reason that's important is really to minimize friction, because the more things you have to put in your mind as you're building software, 
the more friction is in your head, and uh, you know, the, the less flow you will have as you're working. So in a way, it kind of drives down productivity. So uh, Mike came up with this theater metaphor to make desktop development a bit more fun as well, uh, as, as well as to encourage developers to think more about the uh, interactive aspect of it. So desktop applications in this theater metaphor can be thought of as productions that consist of stages. Each stage is a window. So let me go over the over here. So stages define windows, and then each window has scenes. Scenes are transitions in a stage that happen on the stage. And scenes usually consist of props. So props are the widgets that you see on the window. And then styles. So styles are kind of like the CSS. As well as players. Players are actually the models that back the props in order to get the job done. So that's like, the, so this is very comparable to, you know, does, does that remind of anyone of a pattern? that we, everybody follows in the software development? MVC. I guess it's to be, yeah, MVC. So it's pretty much an analog to MVC, uh, except that's more tailored toward you know, interactive desktop applications. So um, what he did is he basically allowed the ability to build all those layers in pure Ruby. So he can build the user interface in Ruby to replace the HTML. He can do the styles, he has a CSS-like syntax in pure Ruby as well. Uh, and then you can build the models in Ruby, which are the players in this case, and as well as the... Uh, and then you can configure the app with Ruby. That's kind of like how Rails gives you a part of the ID. <coughs> Limelight also gives you the files like environment RB to configure the app with Ruby as opposed to like in the Java world XML. Uh, this framework also supports 2D and animation. And applications are launched with the limelight command. Um, it, is also, it also offers independent, uh, platform independent widget support, the uh, Java Swing library. So it also runs on JRuby. So let's open it with uh, a with little. I actually believe I have all of this ready. Yeah. So if you look at the folder structure, I'm going to zoom in a little bit on it. So uh, look, focus on path later. Production RB is the file that defines the application. So that's kind of like environment RB in Rails. Uh, stages RB defines the stages. So these are two configuration files, the pure RB. And then you got a full a directory for scene, which is a calculator scene. There's only one scene. Um, it's actually a directory for stage, is what I meant to say, sorry. Um, and then props, st props, styles, and players. So let me open, let's start opening the file right here today. So this is the props, that's the user interface. This is the styles, so that's like the CSS equivalent. Button RB defines the model that backs one of the buttons. And, it, and then here it defines what happens when you click the mouse. This is an example of stages RB, which define the stages and production RB. So useful uh, commands in Limelight are, you know, Limelight create is like the generate command in Rails. It lets you generate uh, the Limelight structure for you. Uh, Limelight open launches the app, and Limelight pack is very interesting because it lets you package the app to be able to distribute it without people seeing your Ruby code. What's Nice, what's really nice about it though is the ability to launch applications over the web. You can package your Limelight as an LLP file, put it on an HTTP server, and then give people a, a, an 
and not on the L file, the limelight tip file. And then if they call limelight open production LLL, which contains a URL to where the LLP file is, it will launch the application over the web. Let me demonstrate that. There you go. So this is an application that was launched totally over the web. It actually also gives you, this app is built to demonstrate other apps, so it lets you also launch other apps online, so like Hangman, the game. Hangman is actually one of the nicer, more interactive apps that I've seen that, that are built with Limelight. first show you the code. <coughs> so again, you start with a shell. Composites are like this. And then we have label text, label text. We're using the SWT grid layout with two, with two, uh, two columns. So how do we look at the user interface? It's laying them out in two columns. And then afterward, the table shows up. So that's the table. Got three columns, first name, last name, and email. You specify the width for each. Uh, finally, this is the one statement that does the data binding. That's all you need to make it display the data. So what we're saying here is bind the items at the table to the results 
collection on the presenter model with this order, uh, with the column properties being ordered this way. So these are the properties that get picked up from each instance of the results, meaning each one of the rows, and found to the table. So from that point on, if I go and hit list, meaning list me all the uh, contents, or if I even filter and then type find, the code doesn't need to update the view explicitly because binding takes care of that. All I have to do is go and invoke the list method on the model or the find method. And then the model can, not even, can be completely oblivious about the view and not even know about it. Uh, so if you were to open the model, it has no reference of any of the widgets, any of the views. So it's completely decoupled and clean and focused on the business logic. That's it's just performing the find operation or in, in the case of list, is just listing. All it does is it updates the collections value to the new uh, rows that should show up to the user, and by finally takes care of the rest. So that was really the key goal about Glimmer, is to have as clean separation as possible between logic and uh, the view. So data binding right now supports all the basic uh, widgets or basic fields, like text, buttons, spinner, other things. Uh, combo box, contents and selection are supported. List contents and selection, single or multi. Uh, table data loading. Table selection is not supported yet. Means if you want to select a row or select a cell, that's not supported yet. Uh, and tree, tree data binding is, is not supported yet. These two things are in progress. It's just a brief summary of the, the model view presenter pattern, or model view view model. So what happens is, uh, instead of basic MVC, there's a mediator that performs the binding between the view and the model bidirectionally. So it's, 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 some, it's something that sits in between, does the binding. That's just another example. I'm not going to go into it. So let's now go over a comparison of the pros and cons between all the frameworks. because. Each one of them offers things that the others don't, you know, that the others don't. So let's see, uh, let's go over that because that will help you figure out what you want to pick for your next mini project or bigger project, depending on your needs. So Choose is the easiest to get started with. Uh, it's got, it comes with a packager that lets you package your apps and distribute them easily. I haven't played with it myself, but I know it's there. Uh, one of my colleagues used it quite a bit. Uh, syntax is straightforward. Uh, 2D animation support is nice. Um, and the ability to browse your applications, so like web environment, that's not the problem. Uh, what, what is missing? And support for updating attributes on widgets is a bit uh, restricted. So you couldn't update the text of a button on the fly dynamically. Uh, that was true a month and a half ago, last I checked. And I, I reported it to the maintainers of the project, and they said they're uh, they have another slate to work on it. Uh, there's no support for choosing tables, uh, no built-in support for application modularization. If you're a very comfortable OO program designer and or comfortable with uh, you know structured programming, and you know how to break your app where your code is not mangled, you'll be fine regardless of that. But otherwise, Shoes doesn't give you a pattern like Rails gives you MVC in order to support your uh, environment. Uh, or like Limelight gives you the theater metaphor, or Glimmer gives you the data binding support. Shoes doesn't give you that. So often Shoes programs that I've seen have been very dirty as far as mixing uh, logic concerns with view concerns. So that's one thing to watch out for. Now some of the samples that ran crashed occasionally, and maybe bugs in their, in their logic, not necessarily the Shoes code, but since it's all mixed up, I couldn't tell. So I had I to put that on. Okay, Limelight. It also has a packager. Demonstrated, it's the one that packages applications and lets you even be able to deploy them online. Uh, separation of styles and layouts, that's very cool with the CSS like syntax. Uh, modular architecture with the theater uh, metaphor, and then built in RSpec support with the generator, launching uh, app apps over the web. Uh, theater metaphor can be a bit daunting to a beginner, but otherwise it helps if you're building a, a bigger than a small, like a not too small application. Uh, it's reliance on Swain makes it use potentially a lot of memory. That's something to watch out for. It may not be a problem, but it's just something to watch out for. Also on Windows and Linux, Swain doesn't have native field. Uh, Glimmer sim 
syntax is very minimalistic, easy to follow. Data mining uh, support uh, and MVP pattern, I think, makes the glimmer a winner as far as business application uh, applications are concerned. Especially if you, if you write all your logic tests first and you want to keep it as clean as possible from the few concerns. Um, now, uh, it's not my forte to uh, automate things like how to set up Glimmer on your machine, so I don't have a one-click installer, so if anybody would like to help with that, I'd appreciate that. Um, so, I would say Glimmer is not as easy to start with as Lime Life or Shoes right now. Just because you have to deal with bringing the SWT library separately and piecing things together before you can run, run a sample. Uh, the other mic support is still incomplete, no tree support for example. Um, there's still no official support for DSL and uh, 2D and animation. It actually comes with SWT so you can get access to it, but there's no DSL for it. And that's something I've experimented with in the past, but I haven't released any version of it yet. I had a syntax that was similar to jQuery's syntax for animation at one point, but I didn't release it because I wasn't happy with it yet. Uh, so that's that.